All right, I'm going to start off talking a little bit about winter management. Okay. What we want to know at this time of year is my is my colony still alive? Right? What else? Do they have enough stores? Are they going to starve to death come February or March? And how's how big is the cluster and where are the bees? Right? So those are kind of the three main questions that I ask myself at this time of year. So first, is my colony alive? Well, one of the ways you can tell is you get one of those nice warm days and the bees are out flying, right? So some of you have seen your bees flying this winter. Look at this, this the snow is up to over the first deep and just the heat from the hive has melted the snow so that the, bee, the bees could get out. So I thought that was a pretty good picture. But, you know, you get those warmish days, 45 degrees, depending, 50 degrees, sometimes 40 degrees, and your bees will be flying, so that's one way to know. The other is just put your ear up against the hive. Or if you have a stethoscope, better yet, put a stethoscope up to the hive and listen for that buzz. And if you don't hear it, give a couple of knocks, and you probably will hear it if they're alive. Okay? Listen, anybody can chime in anytime they want here, too, if you have any questions. It should have, yes, but it might have been in an out yard where the guy couldn't get to, right? But it's kind of, I thought it was really interesting how the heat from coming out of the hive actually just melted the snow anyway. Okay, here's another way. This is my first gadget. Here's another way to tell if your colony is alive. I saw this on Vsource, so what I did is I bought a $10 indoor-outdoor thermometer from Amazon, of course, free shipping, $10. And what I did with it is, you can see that I have upper entrances on my hives. So I put the outdoor, the indoor probe inside the hive, and I hung the outdoor one on the outside. And I don't know if you can see this, but outside the hive that particular day was 37.6 degrees. And inside the hive, it was 66.4. So what does that tell you? They're alive. They're alive, right? And I just stuck it in, we, I don't really know where the cluster is. Could be here, could be on the side, could be in the middle. Doesn't really matter. The point is, there's heat in the hive, they're generating heat. There's a 30 degree difference between inside and outside. Those bees are alive. So $10. Gives you something to do in the winter, it's kind of fun. All right, does it have enough stores? So we all know the hive tip, right? All you have to do is get behind that hive, tip it up. Is it light, is it heavy, or is it medium? Okay, if it's light, you want to feed. Best thing to feed your bees, honey, if you have honey, and you can get it in there. Um, fondant, we're gonna talk about. Dry sugar, Charles is gonna talk about. So I don't wanna really go into too much more there. But again, there's your honey, there's some fondant, and dry sugar, we'll talk about the mountain camp method. Okay, here's another one, another gadget. You can take a peek in the hive, right? So sometimes you can crack the hive and take a peek, but I found, again, this is Walmart. This is Walmart, Walmart it's an automotive camera, okay? <laughs> Helps you when you're, you know, you're working on your engine and you can't see something. You just stick it down there. Got a little bit of a little screen here. It's actually got a light on the end. So you can put it up in the hive. Well, I, I took my first sting, <laughs> but I stuck this into the hive. First sting of the year. But anyway, so it's a, it's a neat little gadget. A couple of things I found out with it. Number one, when it's sunny out, it's very hard to see the screen. Okay, so keep that in mind. And number two, it takes a while to kind of get a feel for what you're looking at. You know, I mean, there's bees, but it's kind of hard. So I think the jury's still out on this, but $50, Walmart, it's called a uh, Whistler automotive camera. More gadgets. Anybody has any gadgets that they want to want me to try, just give a holler. 
Okay, how big is the cluster? So if it's warm enough, you get one of those warmish days, you can take a quick peek, okay, and see where the cluster is and how big it is. If it's really warm, I mean, look at that's a nice cluster and it's split between the two boxes, right? All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about spring planning. But you know, we should be planning right now. What do you wanna do in the spring? Do you wanna make increase? Do you wanna make more bees? Do you wanna make honey? Do you wanna make both? Do you wanna to try to prevent swarming? So how are you gonna do that? What are you gonna do? You can open the brood nest. You're gonna do a checkerboard like wall right. Are you gonna do something else? You're gonna make splits. So you should be planning that now. now so I have a question, let's throw this out. So what, somebody, can t somebody tell me what's going on in the hive right now, today. Huh? They're dead. <laughs> They're clustered, but what besides cluster? What's going on in there now? It's been going on for about a month. Okay, so the queen is starting to gear up. All right, she's not laying a lot, but from the time you have the win winter solstice, which is December 21st, she starts very gradually building up. And what she's doing is she's raising small amounts of brood what it's doing is it's replacing the older bees, the winter bees, some of which are dying and have died, and she's getting ready, she's starting that ramp up into the spring, getting ready for that hive to swarm. Because if, if, if your hive overwinters, their first goal for that next year is build up enough so we can swarm. That's what they want to do. Okay, so that's happening right now. It's already started. And um, we're going to talk, Kevin's going to talk a little bit about some ways that we can do some, some swarm prevention. Uh, so super reversal, that's pretty uh, common up here. A lot of people do that. Opening the brood nest, pyramiding up, checkerboarding, those are all just other techniques. And Kevin's going to hit some of them today, but as we get closer to the spring, we'll go into some more detail on all of these methods, because there's a lot of different ways to try to prevent swarming. And sometimes, no matter what you do, they swarm anyway. But at least you try. Um, swarm trapping. That's another thing. Think about your spring plan. Do you want to try to catch some swarms? Whether they're yours, which is always happens to me. I catch my own. Um, or do you want to try to get some free bees? So if you do, you know, it's time to make those, those swarm traps. Okay, whether you use a nuke like this, or you use one of these prefabricated ones made out of the, um, the flower pots. Um, I have one like this, two like this actually, that I made, and my first year I caught a swarm in that one. You bait that? Hmm? You bait it or they just go in there? I, I bait it with a piece of old, this blackest comb I can find, and a couple of, uh, a little sponge with some lemongrass oil on it. Last year I caught uh, European hornets in it. <laughs> I posted that on the website, yeah. You know, Bob, and Honey Bee Democracy, Tom Seeley talks uh, about what the ideal trapper and how high off the ground to put it. Yep. That. Yep. So that's a good reference. So, again, yeah, we're talking 35, 40 liters seems to be what they're talking about, which is about the equivalent of one deep. All right, somewhere in that range, that's what they're looking for, ideally. And uh, we heard Deb Delaney at one of the meetings, the state meetings, I think last fall, tell us that all the feral bees that she, say, she sees are all at least 20, 30 feet off the ground. Okay, so they actually don't even mingle with the bees on the ground. So if you're looking to catch feral bees, you gotta get that trap way up high. All right, having said that, you can catch bees at ground level too. Sometimes you just got an old hive hanging out with a couple of frames of old brood in there, brood comb in there, and the next thing you know, you'll have a swarm take up residence in it. So that's another way to catch some swarms. The uh, last thing I wanted to talk about was, I wanted to show this, but we don't have internet access here at the school, but maybe we'll figure out a way to do this somewhere down the road. I'm using some uh, online free software called Hive Tracks to track the mentoring hives and my hives. What's nice about it is, you know, so I had 
between my, my yard and the uh, mentoring hives, last year I had about 12 or 13 or maybe 15 hives. And I, I couldn't keep them all straight. What did I see in this one last time I was in? What did I see in this one? So I started using the software, and it really helps a lot. It helps you track your queens, all your inspections on there. So we'll take a look at this at uh, one of the future meetings when we can get online. It's real easy to use, too, and it's free. The other thing that I'm planning to do this spring is write down my bloom dates. Okay, I've been reading a couple of books over the winter, and they all talk about, well, do it a month before the maple bloom. Well, when is the maple bloom? You know, do it a month before the dandelion bloom. Okay, when is the dandelion bloom? So I, this is the list that I put together because these are all things that, oops, these are all things that bloom near my house. So this year I'm going to write down, you know, dead nettle. Started on this date, finished on that date. And again, it's just a point in time, but just to get an idea of, you know, when, when, what's blooming when that the bees are foraging on. Okay, other things to do this time of year. If you haven't ordered your packages and nukes, you're late, so you better get to it. Order your equipment and make your equipment. This is a great thing to do when it's nice and really cold outside. Make sure your hive covers are secure. And if you've got dead outs in your, in your hive, you really don't want them to be robbed out until you know what killed them, okay? So it would be a good idea if you have dead outs and you know they're dead, to seal them up before you can go in in the spring and find out what killed them, okay? Because you don't want to be spreading disease. So I think that was all I had.